Quo. Happy 4th of July. Hope that everybody is safe, having a good day. And those of you that have an extended weekend, I hope that you also have a safe and pleasant 4th of July weekend. I know that we are out here, most of us, today to kind of commemorate and enjoy the freedoms that have been fought for and won for us by hundreds of years of dedication and sacrifice on the part of members of the United States military and in large part also by the people of all the uniformed services, including law enforcement. Those of you that are out here and enjoying your time off today, I'd ask that if you see someone in uniform, whether it be an EMT or a law enforcement officer, or if you happen to know someone who's in, med in the medical field as a first responder, or if you know someone that's in the military, remember that most of them are working today. So while we are off and enjoying our freedoms fought and paid for at a high price by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men and women, try and remember to be grateful and express that gratitude to those who have given so much. I'm not out here today just to talk about that. My name's Todd. I live here in the region. I do missions work. One of the reasons, uh, the main reason that I come out is to proclaim Christ to the world. And what I mean by that is the gospel, the gospel message. So as we remember and celebrate the freedoms that we commemorate on the 4th of July, I want to quote from Paul, the apostle, the writer of the book of Galatians, from the what we call the fifth chapter of that letter. Paul says in the opening, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. See, one of the things that people in the United States take for granted are the freedoms that we have. Oftentimes what was happening in the early days of the North American continent and the original 13 colonies, many people saw it as a form of slavery. And to a large part that is true. It was a form of slavery. The American colonies, the founding fathers, announced their desire to be free from the rule, the tyrannical rule of King George. And so the comparison that I would make today, that passage that I just read, where it says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free, and that we are to refrain from returning again to a yoke of slavery, is that we may be free from a tyrannical rule in the United States today, but every single person alive now, if you are apart from Christ and His saving work, you are in slavery, tyrannical rule, to sin in your life. Every single person born is born a slave of sin. You are born a sinner. A lot of people will talk about the innocence of children. They'll talk about how sweet and kind children are, but even children are born sinners. You do not become a sinner when you commit your first sin. You commit the first sin that you commit because you are a sinner. Children do not have to be taught how to sin. They sin naturally. They sin freely of their own accord. I use this example often, but when a child's told not to do something, whether it be stay out of the cookie jar or not to get 
into something that their parents have told them not to get into, they'll do it anyway, and then they'll lie and try to hide the evidence when they're caught. That is the yoke of slavery. And a heavier yoke of that is that most of us believe or are convinced that we can work off our sins. That as long as we're doing good works, we are going to be able to overcome those bad things that we do. Some of that is taught and fostered by different denominations. There are, folks have a good day. There are churches and denominations out there that tell you that Jesus has done everything that needs to be done for you to be saved. Now you just need to obey. And it sounds right. Others will tell you that you have to do good works to be saved. That appeals to our human side, to our flesh, because in our American ruggedness, our rugged individualism, everybody wants to be responsible for their ultimate end. We want something to do. We, we want to be given a list of tasks, things that we must do to be saved. Paul, the same person that I quoted here in the beginning of Galatians chapter 5, himself says in Ephesians chapter 2 that you are saved by grace through faith and not of works. Because if it's works, then you can brag about it. So those of you that can hear today, my question is, if you consider yourself a Christian and you believe that when you die you are going to go to heaven, what is it that's going to earn you your place there? Are you trusting in baptism? Are you trusting in the good works that you have done? Are you trusting in your good deeds outweighing your bad deeds? What is it that you're trusting in? If it's any of those things, if it's not Christ alone that you're trusting in for your salvation, then you are in danger. See, God has a standard for entry into heaven. And the standard is ultimate perfection. No one enters into heaven unless they're ultimately perfect. You have to be perfect to enter into heaven. So the question is, according to the scriptures in Romans, Paul has taught us that for all have sinned, and all means all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What's that mean? If God demands perfection, ultimate, pure righteousness, to get into heaven, how on earth, if we're all sinners, do we get there? If you recognize your sinful estate, and what I mean by that is, is that every single person has violated the high and holy standard of God's eternal moral law. No one keeps God's law perfectly. You cannot. God did not give his commandments for, to us for us to have a guideline to know how well we're succeeding. He gave us the Ten Commandments for us to recognize and realize just how fallen we are. See, these Ten Commandments, the eternal moral law of God, most people are familiar with at least a portion of them. God says, do not lie. Do not commit adultery. Do not commit idolatry. Do not steal. Those, those things that God has commanded, He has not commanded just because He's trying to rain, our parade, rain on our parade and take away our fun. He's saying, do not violate these standards because I myself do not lie. I do not steal. I do not commit idolatry. I do not commit adultery. I do not murder. So, let's assume for a moment that you believe that you are not guilty of murder. Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 5, 
chapter 6 and chapter 7, Jesus delivers what many refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. And in that message, as he's preaching to the masses surrounding Jerusalem, surrounding Israel, or throughout Israel, as he's standing there on the side of the hill preaching, he goes through and he dissects the Ten Commandments and he makes it so clear that murder isn't just a physical act. It's not just something that you you do where you go out and you unjustly take the life of another person. He says that if you hate someone, in God's eyes, you're guilty of murder. If you call someone that you're close to, a brother or a co-worker or a friend, if you call them in God's, in God's eyes, if you call them so much as a fool, God sees you as guilty of murder. God says that if you even look with lust, so looking at someone that you are not married to and thinking sexual thoughts of them in God's eyes makes you guilty of adultery. Those are the words of Jesus. It's not my interpretation of the word. It's exactly what Christ said. How about idolatry? Most of us recognize the term idol. It's not just the last name of a famous British rock star from the 80s. An idol is anything that you worship or set up as owing allegiance to. God says to us, do not commit idolatry. But today, people in the United States especially, we don't tend to fashion wooden statues or stone statues or statues made out of gold or silver and then put them on an altar in our homes and then bow before those things and worship them. But make no mistake, in the United States, most of us are guilty of idolatry. One of the things that we idolize in the United States is our freedom. We have an entire day dedicated to celebrating our freedom, and that in and of itself is not wrong, but most of us abuse that freedom. We make that freedom more important than anything else. I hear it all the time, I have the right, I have the right, I have the right. Whatever the case might be, I have the right comes out of people's mouths so often. So our freedom in the United States is a form of idolatry. Our leisure time is a form of idolatry. Heaven forbid, quite literally, that anything stand in the way of our relaxation. Our relaxation and our leisure is a premium for us. We will invest ourselves in, in, to the gills. We will go into debt to have leisure time to travel, never thinking about the debt that we're leaving to our children and our children's children because our leisure time is precious to us. But most of us do not understand what it means to not commit idolatry and that's why things like freedom and leisure time and material goods become so so precious to us, more important to us than even God. So, if those are how God, through Christ, defines sin, if he defines murder as even thinking a hateful thought or expressing hatred or severe dislike towards someone, then aren't we all guilty? How about lust? Most of us, red-blooded Americans, especially males, are so guilty, not just of the physical act of adultery, but of just the, the thought process that leads to it. We just celebrated an entire month of June, the entire month of June. One entire month, one 30-day period is dedicated to pride for lustful desires. 
the LGBTQ community is filled with lust, just like the heterosexual community is filled with lust. But unlike everybody else, they parade their pride in their lust, all the while flaunting it in God's face by taking the rainbow that God created, God designed, and using it as a symbol of their sin. We are surrounded by lust and idolatry and murder continuously wherever we go. It's in our hearts. It's in our minds. It's in our daily practices. And then God says, keep my law perfectly. Be absolutely perfect or you cannot enter into heaven. And most people say, well, I do more good than I do bad. And then James, Jesus' little brother, writing in his epistle to the church, James tells all of us, if you break so much as one of my commands, this is God, if you break so much as one, as one of God's commandments, you're guilty of them all. And the reason that that's heinous is not just because you've sinned against your fellow man, but because you're sinning against an infinite and eternal God. So when you sin, even if you sin only one time in your entire life, in the eyes of God, that one sin is enough to condemn you for eternity. So, as I said, if the standard to end, for entering into heaven is 100% perfection, 100% righteousness, and that's not an if, it's true, how do sinful, fallen people who are completely guilty before God enter into heaven. It has to be through someone else because it cannot be according to our own good works. It cannot be according to our own merits because our own merits are failing. God tells us in His Word that your most righteous works are like dirty rags. Filthy rags are worthless. They're useless. So it has to be through someone else. And that's why I quoted from Galatians 5 where Paul says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It's Christ who died to set us free from the yoke and bondage of slavery. It is Christ who came and did what we cannot do as sinful fallen human beings. It's Christ who kept the law of God perfectly. Only Christ could do that. Jesus Christ the second person of the Trinity, 100% God, 100% man, perfectly without sin from the moment of his conception until the moment of his birth where he was hung on the cross and died under the wrath of the Father. Only Christ can set us free. Only Christ can say, pay the penalty for sin. And don't think that the penalty for sin was the cross. The cross was a means of the execution of the God-man, Jesus Christ. But the cross is not payment for sin. So many people throughout history have believed that is because Jesus died on the cross, that the cross was the means by which we are saved. And to a degree, yes, like I said, Jesus died on the cross. That's 100% true. But what he experienced on the cross was not just physical suffering. Yes, it was excruciating. In fact, that's where we get the word excruciate. It is from the word for cross. Crucifix. It's an overwhelming and unbearable pain that most of us could never imagine. How's the joke go that a, a woman delivering a baby only gets a glimpse of the kind of pain that a man is in when he has a cold? Those two things, and I would say from what I've heard, that a woman delivering a child and a man passing a kidney stone experience about the same kind of pain. And those two pains are nothing compared to what Christ experienced on the cross physically. But it wasn't the physical pain of Christ on the cross that satisfied the wrath of God. 
for sinners. Paul, writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, says, For he, God the Father, made him God the Son, who knew no sin, to become sin on our part, so that we could become the very righteousness of God through Christ. What happened on the cross was while Jesus hung there and suffered the same kind of physical pain that thousands of other people suffered, having been beaten beyond recognition, having suffered in ways that other people had, all, had suffered before him and millions after him suffered, while he was on the cross, he did one thing that no one could do. He bore up under the wrath of God against sin and sinners. Jesus took hell on himself on the cross. Psalm 22 was written by David centuries before Jesus came, centuries before Jesus ever went to the cross. And, why, and what David said there was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, G and David was talking about something he was experiencing, but he was also speaking in a prophetic way, and it was a messianic prophecy. And Jesus echoed those words of David while he was on the cross. It was one of his seven sayings from the cross. And he said, Eloi, Eloi, Labak Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because for the first time in eternity, for the first time in all eternity, the perfect triune God had their beautiful communion, their beautiful fellowship severed. The Father and the Holy Spirit were cut off from the beauty of their communion with the Son. And God, the Father, in disgust for the sin that Jesus bore upon Himself, took upon Himself, that God the Father put on Him, God turned away from that. Not because he was too sad to see it, but because the scriptures teach us that God cannot abide the presence of sin. Sin cannot abide before God. And so God turned his back on God the Son. And Jesus absorbed his wrath. An eternity's worth of wrath for anyone who would believe. And make no mistake, if you are a believer, Jesus did pay your penalty. But if you die and you have rejected Christ, or if you think you can earn your way to heaven, or you think you're good enough to get there on your own, or if you say, well, I don't believe in God, when you die, the wrath of God remains on you, according to John chapter 3. And I am out here today not because I want to condemn that is not my place. God is the God of, who judges. God is the one who judges. People say to me all the time, only God can judge me. I agree 100%. It is only God who can judge. And that should terrify anyone who says only God can judge me. Because you who would say only God can judge me do not understand the judgment of God. You do not understand the holiness of God, the justice of God. And you do not understand the mercy or grace of God if you think that you can flippantly say only God can judge me. But it is God who saves. It is God who, according to His own free and sovereign grace, hung by the hands of sinful men, hung His own Son on the cross and poured out His wrath on Him for the sake of love. So if you're trusting in your own righteousness, if you're trusting in your baptism, if you're trusting in... Have a good, have a good day, sir. Thank you very much. I thank you. I appreciate that. If you're trusting in your own righteousness, 
I implore you, today, Christ promises to free you. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. But don't return to the bondage of the slavery of your sin, to the heavy yoke of your own self-righteousness. Take on yourself the righteousness of Christ, and God promises to deliver you. Not just from your sin, but from the penalty that you deserve for your sin. For the penalty that you deserve for your unrighteousness. God will save. He who has begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it on that day. God will save. In Jesus' first words of public ministry as he came out of the wilderness after being tempted for 40 days, Jesus comes out of the wilderness and he says, Repent and believe the gospel, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus did it all. Jesus paid the full penalty for anyone who believes. And he commands you to repent. Turn away from your love for self and sin. Turn away for anything, from anything that you love more than God. Anything that you've set up as being more important to you than God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Anything that you cherish more than God here on earth or anywhere else. Repent of that. Repent of your sin. Confess with your mouth that He is Lord and believe in your heart that He is Savior and you shall be saved. It's a promise of Scripture. Because God loves in ways that we cannot understand. If you've heard this and you have any questions, if you want to ridicule me, want to make fun of me for standing on a rock on a hot day on the 4th of July, I'm okay with that. I am not hostile. I will have a civil conversation with anybody. But if you if you have any questions, you want to challenge me, please do so. I, I, I enjoy it. I'm out here to talk. And like I said, I'm not out here to condemn. That's not my place. I will point you to Christ because I love you as a fellow image bearers of God. I love you enough to tell you that. So if you've never heard this message before, if you think I'm strange, that's all right. My wife thinks I'm weird too. She's praying for me. I don't know exactly how she's praying for me, but she she is. My friends think I'm strange, even the ones that do what I do. But come talk. I promise I'm not going to hit you with anything. And I'm not going to yell or scream. But I welcome conversation.